So hello and welcome to this lunch session uh, with a most unusual businessman. Uh, he's been called an, he's been called anti-business actually. Uh, he's been called an activist billionaire. He's been called a green tech corporate raider. Um, but for me, I have to admit that five years ago, I did hear that uh, TEDx talk on uh, the imposter syndrome, uh, which, was, which was extremely interesting. And uh, I'm sure Mike will tell you more about that. Um, but he began it by saying that his priorities when he started uh, out, even pre-Atlassian, were two priorities, not to get a real job and not to have to wear a suit to work every day. Of course, you're halfway there today. Um, so I don't want to start by asking you, Mike, why does renewable energy, why does green tech, why does decarbonization matter so much to you? Um, uh, that's a very big question to start with. Uh, look, I think it matters to all of us, right? Um, we... Uh, um, look, we, ha we have to solve this problem or we're all not going to be here. And it's kind of what human beings do is we survive and we grow and we thrive and we move forward. Um, this is the challenge of our era, right? I, I try not to lay blame in the past. I think it's uh, all the things that we've done as a, a species to get here. Uh, we need to change our fundamental sources of light, heat, motion, all of which are fossil fuel based fundamentally. If you do that part of the problem, you take care of 90% of the challenge. Um, and if we don't, we're not going to be here. So there's not much more of a fundamental problem to attack. Um, it's a source of much frustration for me uh, uh, in a lot of different areas I'm sure we'll get into. Um, I think we have a lot more solutions than we give ourselves credit for. But it's a massive strategic, financial, scientific, um, you know, an economic challenge uh, involving the tragedy of the commons that is our planet. And so it's, um, I don't think there's much better things to put my side brain power towards. Um, and so... That's what I've sort of gotten, gotten into over time. Even so, you didn't come to it naturally. You started with software um, and, uh, and, and have worked into this. I'm sure along the way, you've met not only those who think that the kind of narrative we heard, for example, on renewable energy uh, in, the, uh, in the previous session was unrealistic. And I'm sure you meet a lot of people who are actually downright climate skeptics. What do you say to them? Um. Well, firstly, I, I did come most of my life's been an unusual path, but uh, the, look, the skills you're going to need to go forward are skills in science, skills in technology, and skills in business, economics, finance, and that's literally what I do every day. So uh, although I took a circuitous path to getting into the, the climate and decarbonisation space, I'd argue I have probably the skills that you need um, in, in across those different things. Um, look, I don't have a lot of time for climate sceptics nowadays. I don't think most of the world does, to be fair. Um, it's pretty clear what the science has been saying, it's clear for a long time. What's more important is that the Overton window has shifted and it's clear to pretty much everybody nowadays, right? It's not a questionable thing. There's a questions you could argue about how fast we should go and how much pain we should take to get there. But in terms of is this the case um, that we need to do something, it's a, it's a non-question. Um, th the question about, like to, to the previous panel and things, um, look, I think, I'll put up the top, I think research is really important. I think we need to do some research to uh, look at other ways to solve the very last 5 to 10% of the problem. I would argue we have all the technology we need today, we've had most of it for a long time, to solve well north of 70 to 80% of the problem. And people will say, well, that's not the whole problem, we shouldn't start. No, that's actually the wrong attitude. Let's not forget the cost of climate action increases every single day. Right? In any which way you look at it, it gets more expensive to solve this problem tomorrow than it did today and it will continue to get more expensive to solve the problem. So if we honestly want to solve it as cheaply and with the least pain possible, that is tomorrow, that is today, that is not in the future. If we get rid of the 70% of the problem that we can do with today's technology, that gives us multiple decades to have more and more technological solutions to solve the really hard, gnarly last 1% or 2% of the problem, which is what people get obsessed by talking about. The bulk of the 70%, 80% of the problem, we can solve most of it today. And we have the technologies that we need today. We've built them over the last 50 years. Uh, it's interesting, and I do want to come to how to make clean power cheaper, because that's a big uh, challenge in India, of course. Um, but the question, you know, what, uh, 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 we saw, of course, a few years ago when you and Elon Musk went head to head with a $50 million bet, I think it was, uh, to build a, 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 a storage facility for 100 megawatts. 
uh, in 100 days. It's a bet you said you were very happy to lose. But the question I had really is, is it, a, is it really a conversation between two billionaires? Because eventually, um, the, the real victims of climate change are not those that are trying to get access to a storage battery or to an electric vehicle or uh, you know, to, to some very expensive technology, but those who are facing it every day in the floods they face, in the lack of electricity, in, uh, in their crop cycles going bust. Uh, do you think it is a little elitist to start at that end and not the other? Um, well, we all share one planet. So, no, I think the, the, the elitist problem is to say that I don't have a problem to solve. I'm going to go solve it for someone else first. We have to solve our own problems first. Let's be clear. Australia is one of the wealthiest nations in the world. We've also out and out for the last 10 to 20 years been a dead set climate criminal. And we are starting to change that. That's good. We've lost many, many years in that problem. Uh, and we should be slightly ashamed of that, right? And we should actually start to make ownership, take ownership of the problem. It's not like we don't have the money to solve the problem in Australia, right? We choose not to use our wealth to solve the problem. So the elite part of the problem is not, you know, well, let's push it somewhere else. Um, no, I think we need to solve the problem. I think the, 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 the Elon bet, as it's called, and he, he thinks that's hilarious. Um, look, look, I think it's a really powerful example. Um, what happened in Australia is uh, uh, through a series of story I won't get into. You can read it online many, many places. Um, we ended up building in about 100 days, a little more, um, the, what was at the time the largest battery in the world. So it's about three times larger than, than the battery that humankind had ever made. Right? And it got deployed in 100 days, call it six months. And uh, it served a number of really illustrative purposes that apply to many, many other um, challenges in the decarbonisation space. Firstly, it was panned by many, many people as being impossible, expensive, uneconomic, negative ROI. It was called the big banana of Australian energy projects. It was called the Kim Kardashian of Australian energy projects. These are a whole series of very famous politicians and, and statesmen, etc. cetera. Um, guess what? It was built in six months. It was built on time and on budget. And it was incredibly profitable very, very fast. Right? McKinsey study showed it paid back its ROI in a number of years. This is a 20-year-plus asset. Right? So what it laid bare in less than 18 months is how much the narrative is what's actually driving this. We had the technology, all we did is deploy it. And what we've got to get good at is deploying technology at a massive scale, not inventing new technology. We didn't need to invent anything, right? We invented nothing at all, in fact, for that. Uh, all we did is deployed it, but the very people who were still around 12, you know, six months before and six months after, you know, should have been far more called to account and said, well, why did you say all these things, right? They just weren't true. They were, they were straight out false. Um, so it's a very powerful example of how much we can actually, when we choose to take action, make change with today's technology and make a huge impact relatively fast. And that's a powerful fast. point you make, that actually all the technology we need is already here. Now it's a question of scaling it up and, and making it more uh, sustainable and affordable. Uh, now, what are and the to, reasons... To, can I point out to that, to the point of scale, right? If you don't come from the technology industry, it's very hard to understand the learning rate, cost economics and scalability of some of these technologies. But that battery leads into a perfect example. That was a 150 megawatt hour battery in roughly 2017, I think. Right now, up in the Barclay, we're starting to build a 35 gigawatt hour battery. So that was three times larger when we built a 150 megawatt hour battery. Within a decade and change, we'll build a 35 gigawatt hour battery. So the scale that happens, the orders of magnitude improvement in 10 years is vast. It's the same thing we've seen in solar. It's the same thing we've seen in any modular renewable technology, and it will continue to go. So when we're betting on the future, we shouldn't be betting on today's price ca cost capabilities. We should be betting on those improvement curves. Um, and there's no better example than in, in large scale storage like that. Sure. Um, now, one of the reasons that you were called the corporate raider uh, was because of a bid you made for uh, an Australian company, in fact, Australia's biggest carbon emitter, uh, AGL. And uh, you said publicly, in fact, that your aim was not just to take it over or to improve technology, it was to shut down coal plants. Now that's fairly drastic in a world that is really still not committing even to, you know, in the last, uh, uh, at, the, at Glasgow, I think countries couldn't even agree to saying that they would phase out uh, coal. They were going to phase down coal. I know that's something India got the bad rap for. But the truth is, if we look around the world, people are actually moving more towards coal, in, particularly in the last year, in terms of uh, what we've seen coming out of Ukraine, 
um, and the kind of instability around the world, uh, in a sense, is lending itself to more traditional forms of, uh, um, uh, you know, power generation. Um, so, so the the question really is, are you really trying to do this too early? Uh, no. So, firstly, the, the world as a whole is is definitively moving away from coal. Uh, on either an absolute or a relative basis, so we have to remember our energy usage goes up, and so on a relative basis, uh, proportionally, it's, it's going down on a, on a global basis. And Australia's no better example than there, where it's it's going down precipitously fast now, which is excellent. Not fast enough, but certainly precipitously fast. Um, secondly, the goal with AGL is not to shut down coal plants. That's not the goal. The goal with AGL is to uh, show that it can be a profitable exercise to decarbonize large-scale companies, and to have the um, What's a polite phrase? The uh, gumption uh, to to attack that problem, right? And to have a go at actually attacking the problem. The, uh, AGL is a very, very proud Australian company. It's 140 plus years old. It's one of the oldest companies in Australia. Um, it started as the Australian Gas Lighting Company. Uh, it was originally lighting up street lights in Sydney with shale oil gas. So it's been through plenty of technological transitions in its history over that many, uh, many, many period of time. Um, and it's a great example of the um, corporate malaise, I would argue, that's hit a lot of these companies. It has zero investment in effectively trying to decarbonise or to transition itself. Um, and as such, it's been utterly hammered, right? It used to be a $22 billion Australian company. When I got involved, it was a $4.5 billion Australian company, and that happened in five years because they utterly underestimated the power of the future, the speed of the transition, didn't invest in it, um, classical kind of story of corporate Kodaking kind of a thing. Um, now, I happen to believe that we should get involved in these companies and change them in a meaningful way. I think it can be an incredibly profitable investment, I've said very clearly. Um, part of the problem is they can't, they have financing issues, they have also other issues because of their ESG status, rightly so. It's one of the most polluting companies, if not I'd argue the most polluting utility per billion dollar of market cap in the world. It accounts for about 9% of Australia's emissions. Now, if you want a nice emission stat, which I think just for relevance, we're talking about Australia and India. So India accounts for about 3.2% of the world's emissions. And I think you have 1.34 billion people. Call it 1.3. Uh, Australia, so 3.2% in India. Australia accounts for somewhere between 1.4 and 1.6% of the world's emissions. And that's without counting exports, where we vault over five. And we have 25 million people. I think we have the population of about uh, uh, Mumbai. And we are accounting for about half of India's emissions with a population that's approximately the same as Mumbai. That's about 40 times emissions per capita higher than what India is. So we have a big part of the problem to solve. This is a significant proportion of the, this is nine or 10%. So it's about a thousandth of the emissions of the entire planet. I would argue we can solve in the next eight years just by transitioning this company. And that's why, I, that's my sort of nights and weekends job to try to do that. Right, but uh, you call it antediluvian, you call it uh, corporate malaise not to be looking beyond coal, but at the end of the day, when we look at India-Australia ties, uh, so much of uh, the bilateral relationship is about coal. Uh, I think $14 billion of the $63 billion that uh, Australia um, uh, exports of coal uh, comes to India. Uh, so the, the question really, is it then okay to transform Australia but then to export coal? Uh, look, I don't, that's a hard question. I don't think it should be. Uh, I, I believe in some form of, of raw economics, though. Um, would I be building a coal mine now for the next 40 years? No, right? Put the climate aside, that's a terrible investment. It's not going to be there. So um, that's why they're not getting funded and built, because there's a negative ROI over the lifetime of those assets. So some part of that will take care of itself. Um, India is already transitioning itself at increasingly rapid pace, and I think can learn a lot from Australia's transitions in its grid, its energy sector. Um, can't learn anything from us in electric vehicles. Sorry, you guys are ahead there. We can learn from you. That's why we're bilaterally learning here. Um, I do think we should zoom out. We'd be very careful with Australia. We often think about coal and gas. Um, and let's be clear, gas is, is probably a bigger problem for us than coal um, in the next sort of 10-year period. We think about ourselves as a coal and gas exporter, right? As a fossil fuel exporter with the third largest fossil fuel exporter in the world. We often uh, team up with Saudi Arabia and Russia and vote for stuff. They're not, not peers we often have and not people we kind of want to be hanging out with in a gang. Um, but if we thought about ourselves as an energy exporter, 
What did you start exporting energy in the history? We exported a lot of wood, we've exported a lot of coal, we've exported a lot of gas, we're an energy exporter. Our future of our economy is in being an energy exporter. It's doing the same things we are. We just need to not think about ourselves as being in the railroad business, but think about ourselves as being in the transportation business. And then we'd start investing in airports and planes instead of railroad companies that die. And that's, as a country, our biggest challenge, is fundamentally understanding that we have such a huge opportunity. We have three billion consumers to the north. We have, as was pointed out in that session, more land space than we, we know what to do with. We are blessed with massive, um, not just geographic resources, minerals and materials, yes. Sun and wind, yes. Sunniest, windiest continent on Earth. Um, but also financial resources in terms of our capital markets, fifth largest capital market in the world, and technical resources, right? Our brains, our talent. So we have all of the resources required to build like a real renew renewable energy superpower um, and we would still be an energy exporter. We would just export it in very different forms than we have traditionally, but we've, we've made those transitions as a country before. Interesting, and the Sun Cable project you spoke about with Singapore is a part of your transnational dream, if you like. To sure, um, and one that we're working with, with India on, as I mentioned, uh, with your one, uh, one Sun, One World, One Grid. Yeah. Um, so, look, th there are three fundamental forms that I believe Australia will export its energy. Uh, one is directly via cable, uh, today, it's by far the cheapest way to do it. Uh, it's by far the most consistent. It's by far the least lossy in terms of how much energy is lost over that cable distance. Um, so think about that as a very long extension cable. It just happens to go about 3,000 kilometres um, undersea. Uh, the second way we'll export it is by hydrogen or some sort of products like that, where we take large-scale renewable energy, uh, massively large-scale renewable energy, and turn water into hydrogen and other byproducts and export that as a transportable uh, fuel source. Uh, for things like long-distance shipping, it's going to power long-distance shipping, but also as, a, as an exportable uh, uh, source to lots of other economies. Um, and then third is by higher-valued higher valued, uh, exported materials. So, you know, instead of iron ore, green steel, instead of uh, bauxite, aluminium, instead of um, lithium, like fully manufactured batteries, the fundamental input cost of most of those up-leveling of materials is energy. So as our energy cost goes down, and we should have the lowest price of energy in the world in Australia, we are able to take on much more of that manufacturing, which is generally in those I examples less labor intense and more energy cost intense. We are effectively exporting our energy if we use it locally at very cheap prices to export higher valued manufactured goods. Um, and that's where I think there's a, there's a lot of work we can do um, between the two countries. Well, in India, there's also the debate about uh, holding back competitiveness in a sense. You can talk about cheap power, but then you have an issue. Uh, when it comes uh, to being able to sustain the high rates of growth that India really needs to move forward towards a developed country. Where do you think the balance really lies when it comes to competitiveness about being able to produce growth for the, for the Indian population versus what you just described for Australia? Um, I, I mean, I would say I'm not a super expert on that. I, I don't think it's much different. Again, if you look at Australia, all new energy generation in Australia is renewably powered, increasingly now with, with full firming, um, so some form of storage or contracted or, or physical storage assets, because that's the cheapest form of power that we have ever had as human beings. So renewables are the cheapest source of power. So with growth comes energy consumption. Um, done right, absent any uh, uh, fingers on scales in the system, uh, that would all be renewables almost everywhere in the world. Uh, as you need those new powers, those are the cheapest sources of generation. So that is what you will continue to, to consume. That in itself makes renewables cheaper, right, because of the modularity and the learning rate of, of uh, the core renewable technologies in, in, in solar, wind and, and lithium-ion storage, for example. Um, that's a really good thing because that actually makes the precipitation happen faster if organised correctly. When you have other interference in the system, th that's not quite the case. But on a... I would argue on a strict market-based system, that will win in, in certainly in the vast majority of countries in the world today. I think it's important that you say a strict market-based system because, of course, the first wave of, of renewable energy in India actually had a very hard time uh, because there were uh, stipulated prices for uh, energy which they just couldn't sustain at that time. So I'd like to ask you where you see your business in India moving. What kind of support or cooperation do you see with India, is it about transfer of technology? Is it about uh, manufacturing? Where do you see your role? Uh, from the point of view of in the decarbonisation businesses or in, in Atlassian software? With decarbonisation. Uh, look, in decarbonisation, I think there's a lot of things we can learn, right? Um, 
Australia has great experience in, in renewables, in uh, renewable deployment and other things, and we are going to be doing that at, at absolutely massive scale in the next 10 years. There's, there's almost no doubt in my mind. How big that scale is, uh, I'd probably add a zero to what most people would think, but it's, it's going to be at massive scale. So we're going to have a lot of that expertise in Australia, um, and that requires a whole set of supply chain aspects and other things that, again, we're very worried about having um, you know, geopolitical challenges getting away of some of that. What we're lacking is in manufacturing capability in Australia. We, we really let that atrophy. Um, and that is something we can learn a huge amount, I think, from, from India and other uh, similar areas. Because when we talk about any of these capabilities in terms of materials, uh, battery processing, when you talk about um, you know, cables or anything else, what's going to be required in Australia is, is far more manufacturing capability than we've had and really an area that we can learn, um, besides the exchange of talent. So... Um, I know of quite a few uh, Australian engineers who've spent time up in India and across large parts of the subcontinent doing large-scale projects and then come back to Australia. I think that two-way flow of people, experience of building these types of projects um, is, is really, really important. I think we can probably also... Um, we have very different energy grids in terms of how they work, both market-based, as you've pointed out, um, and in other areas. That is a source of learning of best practice. Energy grids are kind of a weird thing because they're almost like a singular system. And so they generally move very slowly to change because of the risk to the system. Often the best examples are to look very closely and very deeply at other economies, other grids and how they work. Um, we have a national energy market in Australia, which is a... Um, it's not unregulated, but the price is free-floating, let's just say, uh, every five minutes. And it's led to a lot of the advantages that we have in our energy system. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that we can, we can help each other learn about how to run those at large scale. All right. You did mention geopolitical challenges, so I will ask you that because, of course, uh, Australia is one of the key uh, producers or has the greatest resources of critical minerals, for example. Um, but the processing, the supply chains, actually lie to the north of Australia, in, in really in China, as the world grows more polarized. And that's the trend we're looking at. We're not looking at a trend where the world is putting renewable energy and decarbonization ahead of everything else. Uh, it's a priority, sure, for, uh, for businesses, but I mean for countries, but it's not the biggest priority. What we're looking at instead is a much more polarized world. Do you see a problem where geopolitics could get in the way of this renewable future? Um, I think people are generally aware enough of it. I think there are probably other areas where it would, it would have more impact in the short to medium term, let's call it the next five to ten years. Um, I do think it will be incredibly impactful. In this particular area, there is a huge dependency. It seems like there's a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, possibility to uh, make polysilicon ingots in Australia. There's a lot of possibility to make um, uh, the higher valued manufacturing of some of the materials in Australia, and so we'll continue to do that. What we need to do is just make sure our supply chains are sort of flexible and diverse. We have multiple sources at different points in supply chains. Um, that's, you know, that's a huge problem for me. Certainly in, in Sun Cable, we spend a lot of time worrying about that at the moment in terms of the, the quantum of resources we need over the next five to 10 years, and I would argue 20 and beyond as you get to Cable 2, 3, and 4, is, is ridiculously vast. And so you start you know, working out how is your supply chain going to handle it, et cetera, which means a lot more... Uh, management of that over time. Like, much more careful thought uh, is required for that. Uh, given your experience here so far, do you think the government of India, the, the state policies, are ambitious enough? They have a, a, a net zero target of 2070, where I dare say not many people in this room will be around uh, to see if we make it or not. Um, but, but do you see, especially from your experience at Atlassian Software, uh, where there are the gaps? What do you think the government should be doing more of? Um, look, I only have a, I would admit, a, a cursory understanding of the Indian system, probably <laughs> maybe deeper than most, but from the point of view of Australia, I could go for 17 hours. Um, I think, look, I think 2070 is obviously not ambitious enough from what the planet needs, right? So we should start there. It is more ambitious than India has been in the past, which is excellent. And what we've seen over the last 10 years in most of these economies is ambition growing over time as technology costs come down, as risk comes down, as deployments come. So my guess is that that 2070 date will start to move in. Um, but any encouragement to do so is a really important thing. Um, Australia has only recently had a 2050 date as of not long ago, less than a year kind of thing. Um, 
and we could, as a country, be far more ambitious, and I think we will blow away most of the targets that we actually have uh, anyway, and as we've seen in other countries, as, as you start to achieve, you, you start to ratchet and move forward. So uh, I would be optimistic. The, the possibilities in India are, are incredibly high, right? Um, as I mentioned in, in some of my remarks before, you know, I think Australia and India are two of the um, top 10 to 20 countries most affected by climate change, and we're seeing that. So we need to be aware that there's a, there's a sort of a stick component here where we're like, wow, we both have to really get a move on or that we're going to be in trouble. But secondly, we are both countries that have a lot to gain, right? Have, have a lot of, there's a carrot, there's an opportunity. And I, I found that in Australia, leaning into the opportunity narrative is far more powerful to actually get people to move than just telling them that they're going to die, which you can tell people they're going to die, but guess what? We all wouldn't we eat cheesecake if that was, you know, we would like be super healthy, et cetera, et cetera. And they're generally human beings. We're not particularly good at that. That's sort of human, human nature. So... Leaning into opportunities and ambition is, is a much more powerful narrative for Australia. And I think I see a lot of the same qualities in India about the, the possibilities that are here. Okay. I do want to get to audience questions in just a bit, but I had a couple of questions because uh, you mentioned uh, your plan for Team Anywhere, for more flexible work styles. Um, the truth is everyone thought the pandemic would change us forever. You know, people were suddenly dressing for Zoom, which meant only the top half, um, and uh, were saving petrol bills by not going to offices. Uh, we're thinking in terms of investing in the most important things, which was healthcare, food security, uh, energy security, labor care, taking care of your uh, labor. But eventually, it does seem as if that little bubble of hope that actually something so awful as the COVID pandemic would drastically change the way people think uh, seems to be dying out as we all go back. You're, uh, you're in a suit again and... Um I'm dressed up too. Um, but the, you know, the idea that, do you see the future of work actually somehow improving due to the COVID pandemic or the lessons we've learned? Or do you think we're just gonna go back to the same old, same old? Uh, no, no, I'm a high optimist. I think it's gonna improve. I think it's gonna be very different. I think it has, uh, uh, I think people, let, let's say the, the course of the future of the work has been dented. It maybe changed radically and then gone back, but I think the the, the shape of the curve has has forever changed. Um, I'm a big believer in in flexibility of work. Again, at Lassian's Team Anywhere policy, we allow people to come into an office or to work from where they want. It's a choice. But in order to get that choice, to be flexible on where you work, we are very fixed in how we work. So we've just changed. It used to be very fixed in how you work. You had to come to an office, you sat down at this desk, next to these people at these hours. We've made all that flexible, but in exchange, we, we've changed what we are fixing, effectively. Um, and that has a lot of things around time zones and team construction and travel and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Um, I, I believe it's a far better equation for employees. It's a far better equation for me. Um, it's a far better equation for, for society, if we can lean into it. I've had a number of conversations here with um, uh, uh, parliamentarians and um, uh, politicians from various states uh, in India. And if you are looking at how do you get a rural workforce that is highly paid, this is one of the best opportunities, right? I live in rural Australia. I live in a small farming town. It's not even really a town. And I would not have been able to do that without the pandemic catalyzing it, without technologies like Zoom and, and video conferencing, um, without decent travel links. So I do need to get on a plane and fly here and everything else. So I'm a couple hours drive from the airport. Um, and without uh, amazing internet bandwidth, right? I have uh, two wonderful internet sources, both of whom come through the air now, some from satellite, some locally, terrestrially, um, at, at incredibly reasonable cost. Um, but in exchange, I have a far, you know, uh, different lifestyle. I get back hours every day. I take my kids to school. Um, I can pick them up. I can hang out with them at home during the day. I, I've sort of integrated work and life in a far more... Um, uh, uh, um, in a far better integrated way, I would argue. Um, and so the time I do spend at work is more productive, it's more focused, it's a lesser proportion of my overall time. And I think you'd find that story echoed by most Atlassians, right? And we have north of 10,000 people now working from home in lots of different geographies. As I mentioned, we've got staff in 17 different Indian states at the moment. Um, looking forward to getting to all 28. We now have every, every state in Australia. We have one person in the Northern Territory now, so we ticked the last state and territory box. Well, two major territories. Um, I think it, it changes the nature of work. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's all good. I'm not going to tell you every company is going to go this way. I don't believe that. I believe there'll be companies that are fully local. There'll be companies that are fully remote. And there'll be companies like Alaska that are hybrid. I would contend that the general, you know, normal curve will trend towards 
more remoteness and more hybrid if you look at all the companies in the world, uh, especially the bigger ones. Um, and secondly, it's a different set of trade-offs, right? There's plenty of challenges at Atlassian and there's plenty of people who are saying, wow, it's allowed me to do all these different things. Again, it allowed many of our staff in Delhi to move back to Delhi um, and to be closer to their families, to take care of loved ones and parents and those sorts of things. So we just have to consider all the nuances, I suppose. And do you think businesses are going to be equally flexible, if you like, about their bottom line in the long term? Uh, I would argue it's probably better for your bottom line if done, if done conservatively and properly. Um, we've been very careful about how we've done it. We've had to make a lot of trade-offs, like anything in a budget, right? Um, we spend more on travel and expenses. We will in the long term spend less on rent. We spend more on employee, um, you know, uh, uh, your, your house, right? And it's very hard. It's not like, we, you know, if we buy a bunch of chairs in an office, we keep the chairs. If we buy you a chair, it's very hard to say, can you send us the chair back? Um, so th there's a different set of, of economics behind different things, but we just have to be incredibly intentional about how we do that. Um, and we're very intentional about how we get together. So it, it's a set of trade-offs. Um, but I think we're learning and we're probably on the cutting edge in the technology industry and then specifically Atlassian is really on the cutting edge and um, I, I suspect that we are not an oddball in five years' time. We, we're far more than all. All right. And, and finally, I know you do come back to India. You've brought your family. Uh, as well is the investment in India. And you said you went from zero to 1,400 in just four years. Uh, is it all about good business or is there a personal investment as well? Um, oh, look, I'm very passionate about India. I, I love being here. Um, I'm, I'm, I have a, a, a small life goal to come and watch the cricket here one day, uh, which I've yet to achieve. Um, but look, it's, it's from an Atlassian point of view, it's, it's a business decision, right? It's not because I happen to, to love India and being here and <laughs> that we've made this decision on a you know, big financial scale. Um, it's because of the quality of talent. It's because of the diversity of the talent, which is really important to us, um, both um, thinking about gender and age, but also thinking specifically about location and everything else as we've, we've talked about. So um, the, the depth and scale of the talent pool and the evolution of that over time is really where it comes to for us and the time zone to Australia, right? We have a lot of teams that have one half in India and one half in Australia or across the sort of Asian, you know, through Singapore, Southeast Asia, lots of uh, places that our staff could be. Uh, all the way up to Japan, for example, it's a very good time zone region for us um, in terms of working together and collaborating and flying and things. So um, there's a lot of positive reasons for us to lean into it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to take a few questions from the audience, and I'm told some have already signed up. So uh, is Sahil over here? Sahil? Oh, there you are. Just introduce yourself up. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sahil from ENI. Uh, my question is that you pitched for the renewable energy. Uh, how to make it renewable energy lucrative for a market like India? What would be your suggestion? How, how to make it better for Indian people? How do you make it, sorry, accretive was the question? So basically how to make it lu lucrative, lucrative so that people more indulge in that and how to make it make the business which is related to renewable energy profitable? Um. Look, I think in different ways, you have to continually find sources of economic profit. Um, one important thing to note about all, certainly all modular renewable technologies, almost all renewable technologies, is they're incredibly capex high and opex low. So this really comes down to a financing equation, right? What's capex high and opex low? A house. What did we do? We invented the mortgage. So financing plays a huge part in this, and not just at the large scale, you know, gigawatt solar farm, uh, at the small scale, on a house, on a rooftop, um, there's a lot of microfinance, for example, to say, look, if you put on solar panels, like the way the equation works in Australia, it takes about five years to pay back your solar panels on your house, and that'll last for 20 years. That's 15 years of pure profit. Anybody with a spreadsheet would do that every day of the week, except they don't have the upfront cash. That's where financing comes in, right? In Australia, there's a super competitive market for financed solar on your rooftop, that basically takes the payback period from five years to about seven or eight years after the interest is paid zero dollars up front. So basically you've given away three years of your 15 years of profit, which you didn't have without the cash anyway, and you've just created 12 years of profit magically. Um, what you've done is lowered your bills effectively if you take the, the net equation. Um, I'm not sure how that is in India. I know I've personally done a lot of microfinance work with um, communities in India in terms of, of solar rollout and that sort of thing. But ultimately I think far more of this is a finance equation to roll out the technologies and to show how it's profitable for a uh, household, a business, an industry to transition over a longer period of time and then solving finance to 
um, actually get that through. That's, that's something we've seen in Australia. That's why we have, you know, the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the world by far. So it is, it is true that you made your, you started your first business or rented your first office with 10,000 Australian dollars of two credit cards? Yeah, we did. We started at Lassie with, with about 10,000 bucks on credit cards. Um, look, it's, I don't recommend it as a strategy to anyone else. <laughs> I was going to we say. made it work. Oh, here we go. Um, hi, Sandeep Chandra from the Australia India Youth Dialogue. Um, also a proud Atlassian, so uh, thanks for coming out here, Mike. Um, it sounds like from the Sun Cable Project, it's currently easier for you to export power to Singapore than Sydney. Um, what is, uh, you know, AG, the AGL play obviously is one hurdle that, that we can clear. Um, are, are there other sort of obvious clear hurdles that is getting in, is Australia getting in its own way? Um, look, it's not necessarily easier to send the power to Singapore than it is to Sydney. Let's be clear from what we mean by easier there. It's more economically affordable for us to do that. Singapore has an incredibly high cost of power, has a huge global strategy challenge. So we're talking a lot about global strategy in countries. Um, Australia is a great trading partner with a lot of nations. Singapore-Australia relationship is very uh, uh, key. I think India has a lot of the same opportunities with its nations around in terms of energy export creates regional stability. Um, so it has a very pri high price of power. It has uh, buyers. It's a highly energy constrained market. So in terms of our first cable, which is the Australian Asian Power Link, it is a logical economic opportunity to build there first. That will reduce the cost of the second cable and the third cable. There are far more opportunities outside of that. Um, due to the structure of our NEM and our rules around uh, the grid in Australia, that's another reason why it's there. So yes, there's a, there's a red tape kind of a problem or regulation problem. Um, that's privatisation. It's a long story. We'll get there. We'll solve that over time. All right. On that hopeful note, um, I'd like to thank Mike for... Um, we Maybe we're after. Okay, um, sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Mike for being a great guest, for taking all my questions, as well as some of the audiences. Um, and I'd like to call on Parnevel uh, Tyagraj, uh, the Minister of Finance of Tamil Nadu, to give the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Mike, for an uh, inspiring, precise, and very quantitative analysis of the situation, and thank you, Suhasni, for asking such penetrating questions. I couldn't agree more. I think the technology exists. I think the financing is eminently doable uh, by good grace. I happen to be an engineer and ex-banker myself, so I think Mike's exactly spot on. Let me give you an example of what we're doing in Tamil Nadu. Uh, we're already the highest renewable energy state in India. About 30 percent of our energy comes from wind, solar, hydro. If India is going to get there by 2070, my chief minister says we must get there 20 years ahead because we're that much uh, more developed a state. There's a lot of cost reduction, a lot of new, newer technologies in solar and wind and offshore wind in uh, you know, promising technologies like wave. We too have the great luxury of high levels of insulation, relatively large area of land, relatively large um, coastline. So our ambition is to get to you know, fully renewable and solve the problem of volatility and variability. You know, what time of the day the sun shines and when the wind blows with better storage. Storage in batteries, storage in green hydrogen, ammonia, other products. But I think there's an equally important component uh, which Mike touched on, which is the distributed generation and distributed usage. So we're looking at uh, both in terms of solar on a village by village level as well as wet waste to energy and uh, conversion of existing um, dump yards, basically, uh, to energy. There's a lot of promising technologies. Big oil companies like Shell now have technologies for generating drop-in tank fuel uh, from processing bio-waste. So the, the advantages of going local, I think, um, you know, echoing some of the comments Mike made, and I had a conversation with him earlier, if you can actually solve this problem of maintaining culture, maintaining continuity, getting the full experience of human beings working together while allowing people to stay in their homes, in their villages, you know, taking care of their families, their farms, then you've solved one of democracy's biggest problems. 
because you have now very uneven development, uneven growth, concentration of work opportunities, concentration of wealth, and the ability to distribute uh, high-paid, high-skilled jobs remotely is, is a huge uh, game changer for democracy, not just for the industry. Likewise, I think in the, in the energy space, the more we do diversify generation and local use, we reduce the transportation, we reduce the leakage. In a place like Tamil Nadu, we have probably 30% line loss. Now that's from active subsidy to outright theft. The less we transmit these, you know, the, the less likely those losses are going to be. And we are able to create self-reliance and diversification, right? We, we have one plant go down now and, you know, uh, three districts will be shut off if we have diversified uh, generation, even weather events are much easier to uh, overcome. I think um, policies need to be thoughtful, right? Public transportation, if done right, if done like a Scandinavian model in a state like Tamil Nadu, where 50% of the population lives in urban areas, would be a huge game changer. It would solve so many problems. We have started with free bus travel for women in urban areas after my chief minister made the decision. It has empowered so many people. It has given women so much freedom. We're doing a case study now where they don't need to ask anybody's permission to go to work. They can you know, go at flexible hours. And it's much better for society because we have less crowding, you know, less number of vehicles on the street, et cetera. So public policy done right and done without thumbs on scales, uh, I think, as was cited here, really would tell you that this is not just the cheapest, not just the best, not just the most efficient, but the most equitable way of uh, you know, generating energy and uh, running a uh, uh, scale economy. At the end, in all of this, it comes down to the ability to deploy, the ability to execute. This is what we face every day. Um, by great coincidence, since I was here today, I just stepped out for a little while and I had a conversation with the former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and this is exactly what we talked about, that everybody has ideas, everybody has theory, everybody has knowledge. Whether it's running a party or whether it's running the government, the question is, can you execute, can you deploy? In Tamil Nadu, for example, my biggest concern is that we are fixing our finances so rapidly that our capital expenditure, expenditures will go up 4x in three years. We don't have the consultants. We don't have the ability to monitor these things. We don't have the contractors. We don't, we don't have the scale, and we need to start planning for it now because at that time it'll be too late. So I think as much as it's about engineering, as much as it's about finance, it is about disciplined execution and the ability to administer uh, a vision or execute a vision um, and get it actually all the way to completion. And I'm hopeful that with people like Mike, with the kinds of dialogues we have here, uh, with the engagement of public servants, myself, many from Telangana, some from uh, other states, that we see this as an inspiration. Uh, this is certainly the way to go. Uh, some of us will get there earlier than others, but all of us need to get there eventually. And it's eminently doable, whether it's recycling of water, whether it's public transport, whether it's renewable energy, all these are achievable in my lifetime, not till 2070, right? which certainly my lifetime doesn't extend to that. So I wanna thank, I wanna thank um, Suhasini again, and Mike, and of course, Lisa, for, and, and the team for setting up this inspiring and brilliant conversation and for asking me to give the word of thanks, thank you.